Hello, uh, good afternoon everyone, good morning to some and maybe good evening to others. Thank you very much for joining this Holder uh, hosted webinar. Um, the topic for today is escaping the decarbonisation maze and specifically exploring the investments that deliver a good return on investment, but also an environmental compliance and uh, future proofing fleets. Not necessarily an easy thing as shipping looks to decarbonize and manage the energy transition. It's an ever more complex and fluid landscape. And meeting those three criteria of future proofing, return on investment, and compliance as we uh, further explore this is not necessarily as straightforward uh, as it may seem. And indeed, there may be some unintended consequences. So when we are seeing the likes of the Poseidon principles and the Sea Cargo Charter, right ship and other outside this demand side influences, have we really got a level playing field and how do we negotiate this maze? Um, thankfully, we've got a panel here that have all the answers to those questions. Um, our hosts are Sean McLaughlin, uh, strategy consultant with Holder, and Jonathan Strachan. Jonathan is the new build and vessel conversion director with Holder. And our guest today, uh, Mark Cameron, CEO of Ardmore Shipping, Lindsay Keeble, who's partner and global maritime sector co-head at Watson, Farley and Williams. And lastly, Edmund Hughes. Uh, Edmund, you will know as the former head of air pollution and energy efficiency at the IMO and is now an independent consultant. Um, and just to add that we will be hopefully taking um, the audience's questions. So please, um, please fire away with your questions. We'll try and get through as many of your questions as we can at the end of the, the webinar. So around half an hour, 35 minutes into it, um, we'll have a period of uh, audience questions. So, so please think of those as we proceed. Um, our first question uh, and theme is around the key drivers, non-regulatory and regulatory drivers for decarbonisation in shipping. And I'd like to start uh, with Sean, if I may. And, and Sean, what is the driving, what is driving decarbonisation uh, in your view uh, and which drivers should the industry be prioritising? Thanks. Thanks, Alistair, and uh, welcome to everybody. So I think um, shipping industry is used to responding to regulator push, and it's particularly used to that push coming from one central body, the IMO, and that's created the, the level playing field that uh, Alistair's referred to in the past. I think the reality is now that there's a whole bunch of other regulatory type pushes with the, the likes of the the EU um, stating that they've got different ambitions to the, the IMO. Um, I'm pretty sure that the, the ETS will come in. I'm also fairly sure that it's likely to extend beyond European shipping. Um, and a whole bunch of other um, government-linked uh, drivers. But there's also a lot of pull. And I think in many ways the pull is moving quicker and speaking louder than a lot of the regulators. So you've got pull from the financial community who are responding to the, the risk of a, a customer borrower um, source of investment that isn't complying with the, the drivers for decarbonisation. You've got pull from the, the likes of the members of the Sea Cargo Charter who are saying this is what we want to see. But ultimately, you've got pull from the consumer who are expressing their views at the checkout and in the ballot box. And I think one important thing to recognise from that is that that um, consumer voice is re resulting, at least in the last 10 days, in significantly increased ambition from the UK and the US government. So I think aside from you know, whatever measure you take today, don't think that it's the hurdle isn't going to get higher. Um, against that backdrop, it's a bit of a shame, really, that all the focus is on EEXI and less focus even on the other IMO measure of CII. So I think the, the challenge to, to ship owners is to shift the, the view away from the traditional um, 
target and make sure that the the other ones are being met. Thanks, Sean. Um, and, and Edmund, if I can bring you in with your regulatory hat on, I guess, or a regulatory perspective, what do you see as the, the key drivers that ship owners should be considering um, um, as, as we look to, to manage the, the energy transition in shipping? Well, I can only really echo many of what Sean's comments were. I mean, I, I, I think unlike any other subject matter that the shipping industry has had to deal with historically, uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction is really, you know, a game changer in many respects uh, because it's it's driving an energy transition for the sector, and 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 that energy transition is going to present a significant number of challenges uh, for the sector to address. Um, uh, both from a, uh, we, we've heard from an economic point of view, from in terms of an investment point of view, in terms of a regulatory point of view, uh, partly because from a regulatory point of view, historically IMO has focused on the ship and, and the ship, uh, the ship systems, the ship crewing, the ship uh, uh, technical aspects, the operational aspects of the ship. Uh, and, and but this this requires a, a broader uh, understanding of the, of the whole what's referred to as the value chain and, and so the interaction with the port uh, the ship uh, port interface uh, the land-based jurisdictions who who are who frankly uh, control the production of energy uh, and 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 so it is it's it, it's a much broader broader subject matter and therefore presents a huge different set of changes uh, sort of challenges to the sector uh, and, and I think it was interesting to note um, John Kerry uh, in his announcement about uh, you know the, the, their ambition regarding uh, shipping emissions all, was was sort of made clear that he 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 felt and, and I presume the U.S. <laughs> speaking for the U.S. feel that the, the those who represent or come as delegations to IMO need to reflect uh, and need to represent the the ambition. Of the governments uh, that are coming, uh, that are wider, as 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 Sean quite rightly pointed out, because because we're seeing incredible action taking place by governments in terms of their levels of ambition. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. That, that's really interesting that you both picked up on that point around you know the the heightening levels of ambition, and particularly in the last ten days, uh, or evidenced in the last ten days, and that it's a pretty good segue to the to the next question, which asks why focusing on one driver and there's been a lot of conjecture and discussion and debate around EEXI is a good idea or not uh, and I think maybe given what you've just been saying uh, it might lack a, a little bit of ambition and ability to trigger behavioral change um, I'd like to bring Mark uh, in here at this time as a ship owner Mark what, what are the risks of that sort of one-dimensional approach from your perspective yeah, a couple of thoughts. Um, probably the first thing is that um, already you can start to see people discounting different fuel types and fuel sources. And I'm wondering to what gain and to what advantage. And uh, yes, we all understand that the, the, the carbon uh, relative to the production of, of each of the different fuel types is an important part to bring into the equation. But for so early uh, people to be... To be um, uh, you know, casting doubt on different fuel types isn't helpful to the whole discussion. Um, but I do think, you know, the title of the of the, the webinar, Escaping the Decarbonization May, should really be navigating it because I think the point that everybody's making here is there's no escaping this. You know, we're, we're in this for the long haul. And, you know, the truth is that the prize at the end of the day is that you will live to trade, hopefully profitably, another day. And, you know, that's that's the reality of the enormity of the situation. If you don't navigate this effectively, you quite simply won't be around. And um, I think it's worth reminding ourselves that until big finance got involved in, in this whole debate, um, there was very little that actually happened because it was largely seen as a technical um, area of interest. And with technical, obviously, goes a cost. Um, now that finance is, is much more involved in it, it's a question of not only who's going to pay for it, but who's going to finance the whole asset. And suddenly we've seen an uptake of massive proportion, uh, not just in awareness, but also in sort of looking at generating solutions. So I probably didn't answer your question directly, but 
No, it's good. It's good. And it allows me to bring Jonathan in because I think, you know, the, cons the consensus so far has been that things have and are moving uh, fairly rapidly outside maybe the regulatory sphere. So the reference from Mark to finance and, and obviously the political will that's changing as well. So Jonathan EEXI, to Mark's point, is a very technical um, regulation that will come in in 2023. Is it limited? And from a ship owner's perspective, would it be folly just to focus entirely on EEXI? Particularly, we have, even from a regulated perspective, we have CII, for example, as well. Um, it, it does appear from the outside looking in very complex. Yeah, I mean, EEXI is, uh, is coming into force, as you say, in 2023. So we have to deal with it. But I think focusing solely on um, EEXI will will give you a kind of technical or a reduction in your carbon emissions for for the design of the vessel at a particular loading condition at a particular speed. Um, but it won't necessarily improve your operational efficiency or your um, or reduce your operational carbon emissions. And I think it runs the risk of um, taking the focus away of improving the operational performance of the vessels. And also it, it makes no mention of, of other fuel sources, green methanol, biofuels, carbon capture. Um, you know, if we just focus on EXI, I think we're missing part of the point, in my view. And just quickly, Jonathan, what, what advice, therefore, would you give to ship owners? I think, um, well, we need to... Um, we need to analyze the vessel um, to, to see um, what you need to do uh, for the vessel on its particular, based on its particular operational profile, and then analyze what technical efficiency measures you need to make, the modifications to the ship, and also operational measures, and assess both to make sure you're complying with the EEXI requirements, but you're also making some operational improvements as well. Because um, if you miss out on the operational improvements, then I think you're going to come um, a cropper with some of the other requirements, the carbon intensity index, the requirements from Sea Cargo Charter, et cetera. Um, there are certain things you could focus in on, but, but um, you know, maybe I think there's a bit at the end where I could talk about that. OK, thanks, Jonathan. Lindsay, I'd like to bring you in because from what we've heard so far, it seems like there's a disconnect between regulation and maybe not just technology, but sentiment, market sentiment from outside looking in, from outside finance, from, from the cargo market. I'd be really interested to get your take on where you see, whether you see regulation moving too slowly and whether there is that disconnect that we're hearing about. I think there's two sides of it. I think, as Mark touched on earlier, there's no clear sort of technological solution yet. There's no one chosen route that, that the industry could go down. So I think that makes, on, on the one hand, it quite difficult to regulate when you when there's no clear winner. I mean, there was a few years ago where everyone was saying LNG fuel is the answer and people start building ships for LNG fuel capabilities. And these are long lead items. It's not something you can change tomorrow. And I think people are also ignoring or maybe people that are not involved in the shipping industry that are regulating in terms of EU taxonomy and so on. They are not really understanding the infrastructure and, and the huge sea change, no pun intended, that needs to happen for, for this for this to work. And I, I think we, we saw we, we did a survey in the autumn last year that the, you know two of the main drivers are going to be this regulatory certainty and proven tech. So how do you how do you get one without the other? You know they kind of need to develop and they need to be quite agile, I suppose. So the answer is I I, I don't think you can really blame regulation moving too slowly because the tech needs to to drive it to some extent as well. Um, I think the one thing where I see a risk area is when you have regulation that doesn't understand. The specific industries as you know, EU taxonomy comes to mind, what the climate bond initiative was publishing, where you're ruling out huge swathes of the industry 
that you're going to you're going to sort of strangle the financing that's needed that, that Mark rightly pointed out that's going to fund the transition. You're not going to be able to fund transition if, if people that are, have green money want to put it into shipping, but then they say, well, actually, this isn't as green as I thought it was. So you're going to sort of strangle the, the innovation. The funding for innovation is, I think, going to be difficult to come by if people don't don't change on that. That's really interesting. Thanks, Lindsay. And again, a, a really good marker uh, as we move on to the next theme, which is around smart investments. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think there was always that theory even five, ten years ago around energy efficiency in particular, but decarbonisation and shipping, that if you had the technology uh, and the capital, then the regulation was actually not quite as important. And it feels like we may have the technology and the capital right now. Um, Sean, I'd like to bring you in again, please, um, and, and, and Mark too. Um, how can ship owners better predict ROI and, and create a business case for investment? Does that include compliance with IMO and potential sort of EU green deal, or is it fundamentally around you know that ROI? Yeah, thanks, Alice. So I think you know, to take Jonathan's point, start with the ship, not with the technology you're being offered. And I think also in terms of ROI, don't just think of cash ROI. Think of the ROI in terms of CO2. So you know, often the two will will run together. But um, if if the intention is to to reduce the the CO2 in an operational environment, then with a few exceptions, maybe you're probably likely to hit the IMO targets anyway. So I think focus on the, those operational improvements more than necessarily, um, dare I say, Edmund, a tick box approach to um, to a regulatory approach. Thanks, Sean. Mark, any thoughts on that one? The business yeah. Investment? yeah, a couple. I mean, um, but I just want to make a point first, and maybe Jonathan could answer it later. Why, in heaven's name, are we still producing tankers that are design speed at 14 and a half knots? Who runs a tanker at 14 and a half knots? But we call it this great design speed at a design draft, and we create this whole mythical concept of when we buy a ship and when we build it, that, that this 14 and a half knots is a magical bullet. And then suddenly when we try and translate that, we're trying to come off on an improvement basis a, a num numerical speed value that has no relevance in our, in our sort of trading of the ship in environment. So I think it all really starts back at when we build, when we contract ships, we contract them the wrong way for the wrong reasons by way of design. And the shipyards need to wake up to this and understand the actual trades that ships do. So in terms of ROI, um, look, I mean, Sean, you made the good point about CO2. But, you know, CO2 is money in real terms because CO2 is a function of how much fuel we're burning. And to be honest, you know, in any business case that has a reduction in fuel attached to it is, is worthwhile. A couple of years ago, we looked at LED lights and we priced them out the market. Um, and then we came back a couple of years later and we found that uh, LED lights are actually really worthwhile. And now they, they make a significant difference on our electrical load. And, you know, you have to revisit old theories. And I think that's, that's something that we've certainly learned from. And uh, we're very heavily focused on, on ROI. And I think rightfully so, because as a public company, we have to consider the shareholders' um, interests in us. And uh, ultimately, you know, the, the business serves, you know, that broader need. Thanks, Mark. And Lindsay, turning to sort of industry access to finance, um, for, for particularly around clean technology and and, and obviously, the next phase would be would be clean fuels. Or much we talk about clean fuels, actually, in old money, it, that would be a low, a low sulfur fuel, but you know, low carbon or zero carbon fuels. Um, what are you seeing in terms of the requirement ship owners and operators have for for that sort of that green dollar, if you like? Yeah, it's just, I mean, to break it down into two parts, I think a lot of the um, R&D and the early innovation, I think that we, we're seeing that coming through joint ventures and 
equity which companies have already and you, you know you see joint ventures in the industry between industry bodies working with renewables partners working with the aviation industry as well so I think we do see a lot of that funding coming through joint ventures and, and, and equity and that's definitely what the mood of our clients but I think then the separate bit is the the green green funding and what's out there and you know when you you look at the reported figures I think there's been like a trillion since 2014 and 270 sort of um, billion even in last year in 2020 access for the green projects um there's been suggestions that that's a difficult ask in terms of shipping and, and some of the green bonds have been criticised as a, or how green can a tanker X, Y, Z be. But I think that that's why I think shipping should be looking more at the transition financing, sustainability linked bonds. And, and that is there for, for shipping. And I think, you know, like the excellent Ardmore Progress report points out, it's about selling you, it's about telling your ESG story across the board. It's about showing that you not just have the environmental plan but you have the social and the governance plan so i think that's key to access this green funding it's it's given for industries that, that have the whole esg story and there's no real regulatory rule it's it's showing that you're doing something i think the phrase they like to use is it's beyond business as usual so you need to evidence the story that what you're doing is accessing funding which is going to help develop new technology, new fuels, new operational improvements and to, to input into the R&D. So I, th I think the funding's definitely out there for shipping. I think the industry needs to maybe get better at telling the narrative and working with the supply chain and, and telling that narrative because we don't exist in a vacuum. Shipping isn't, we don't just sell ships around the world for, for, for our own good. It's because of the consumer demand. So I think there's, maybe leading into sort of some of the, the final thoughts is that there's that story piece that needs to be told I think as well to access this money yeah no it, the story piece I think is a perennial challenge for the industry regardless of whether it's finance or other areas but yeah that's a really good point Lindsay and Sean have you anything to add on that question around um, a green green dollar and and, and seeking investment um, I think I'd, I'd certainly echo everything Lindsay said, but I'd probably go a little bit further and say don't expect any finance to be a different colour to green. So there's, there's certainly the, the element in terms of the, the cutting edge beyond business as usual. But if you're not in line with the decarbonisation challenge, you're not managing one of your key business risks. And if you don't manage key business risks, you don't get funded. So you know, the reality is that the future of finance is green, not just the, um, the cutting edge piece. Just to jump back to the um, regulation uh, side of it, one way or another, shipping has to access lots of new technology. The sensible thing to do is to share much of that technology with the, the rest of the world, so not just to have a shipping only solution. If that's going to find its way into shipping, then the regulators need to be open to discussion, both with the technology providers and their funders. They need to be able to give guidance as to what needs to happen to get approval. They also need to think about things like um, regulatory sandboxes where technology can be tried out in a, whether it's geographically or otherwise, in an area where there is some derogation of the, the existing rules. So there is a need, I think, on all fronts to have a, a slightly more dynamic view as to how we, we approach these problems. Thanks, Sean. And just a quick uh, adjunct to that question, if, if I may, I mean, charters are often the elephant, elephant not in the room uh, in, in shipping terms, uh, yet, as we all know, in many cases, particularly non-container ships, they pay for the fuel. Um, there are some progressive cargo owners that do get involved and have created sort of finance mechanisms, perhaps even invested themselves. but. Just sort of throwing this out there, and uh, but to what extent do you feel that cargo owners have a vital role to play here? I realise we have the Sea Cargo Charter in play right now as well. Absolutely, I think yeah, let's be blunt about it. The people who are going to fund the um, investment that shipping needs to make are us, they're the consumer. So one way or another, that price will find its way down the line, and it travels down the line via the via the charters. So it, it's reality. We, we've all got to step up to that challenge. The other thing I'd say, though, is you, you hear um, 
suggestions of a carbon levy of $100 a tonne um, from um, the Solomon Islands and others. What's happened to freight rates in um, the container world over the last six to 12 months? You know, the, the impact there dwarfs any sort of measure such as $100 a tonne. And that hasn't stopped any of us shopping with Amazon, has it? So you know, the, the consumer will step up and the, the, um, the charterers need to, to recognise that and be prepared to pass the cost down the line. Thanks very much, Sean. Any, anyone to add to that one? I can, I can probably say that um, to the question I think that, that Chris Crawley was asking around, um, you know, charters and, and CO2. Um, I, I, don't I can't give a quantifiable number about how charters are looking at, at um, CO2 reports, but I can say there is an increasing number. And I can say that it is creeping into more of the operator level during discussions when you're doing the, the uh, fixing a uh, charter. And of course, we're largely in the spot trade. So um, it certainly is becoming more and more apparent. Um, where we've done some time charters recently, uh, absolutely, there's been a focus on, on efficiency and CO2, as there always has been around efficiency, but definitely a, um, uh, an increased awareness. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, so, so moving on to some conclusions, um, and, and I would like to bring you in here, Edmund. Um, you know, we, we, we just heard about carbon levies and ETS again, and I think Trafagura, you know, you mentioned $100 a ton. I think Trafagura cited three to $400 a ton. And actually, the reality is for the consumer, you know, Sean's right. Uh, the reality is often just a few cents uh, on a pair of trainers or sneakers. Um, you know, it, what decisions need to be made now in order for the industry to meet IMO 2030 targets is, is the question. Um, but I would like to extend it a little bit because what we've he heard today is that, you know, the finance and the demands perhaps of cargo owners is, is all about going beyond compliance. And I'd sort of, you know, be interested in your thoughts, Edmund, as to how you see those two things, you know, co cohabiting, if you like. Mm. It's a, it, I think it's a really difficult one, actually, because, I mean, the international regulatory framework is all about generating a level playing field, whereas what you're also arguing is that charters are going to look to sort of have have ships that, that are, are doing something going beyond that level playing field, which might be the driver. That might, that might be, this may be a new e reality that, that the shipping industry has to, has to accept that, that whereas globalization in the last 50 years of uh, which frankly international shipping has been a great success story you know to support the development of world trade and and, and growth um was based on a level playing field that is you know ships are treated equally wherever they go i mean maybe that, that in future the, the demands of, of particularly large trading blocks um will be different in that they'll, they'll demand that ships have to comply with with a, a range of uh, other other particular provisions and and uh, I mean, there is there is some precedent for that already. Uh, we saw that with the EU, for example, requiring low sulfur fuel to be used at birth uh, before the IMO requirements came in. Um, but I, 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 I think it is a really huge, difficult challenge because because the, the fact is is that the regulatory process requires to look at a ship, not not countries. It doesn't, you know, we 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 devise provisions for the ship, and in, irrespective of which which. Uh, which state uh, flag state that's on, um, where that ship will trade, and that's for good reason because ultimately people want those ships to be able to trade anywhere in the world. So, so it, it, I, I'll be honest with you, I don't have an easy answer to that that question. It's 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 one that is going to have to be uh, sort of dealt with. And by the way, just to point on the levy uh, and the the hundred dollars per ton. That's a hundred dollars per ton of CO two. So, so for your one ton of uh, fuel oil. Uh, which you purchase, you're talking about three hundred dollars uh, uh, figure uh, approximately. So, so uh, which is equivalent to what Trafigura are talking about. So, yes. so yeah. I mean, it is it, it, you know th there is this pressure, and we're now we heard I heard today that the Solomon Islands and uh, advocating that that the the industry should give up its R and D proposal. Well, we've been talking about technological solutions and the need to demonstrate the the the, the you know these work in a, in a sort of uh, without sort of regulatory compliance, and I, and I think you know I don't I don't see how you're going to do that unless there's a global solution to that because you know to, and and I think the industry proposal of a two dollar contribution to generate five billion dollars uh, is a very good way forward. I, I personally I I think I don't see 
how are you going to get agreement across all these other countries? You know, who's going to go away and spend $5 billion on their own without saying, well, that's all our investment. We want to hold on to the IPR. We want to hold. And some states are already, frankly, are already doing that. Uh, and, 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 but that's not going back to the point. How are we going to share that globally then? So you, you need to find a solution um, that is globally agreed. Uh, and, and, and ultimately, the IMO is the right, right institution to do that. I think it's also, again, telling that, that Kerry has announced the, the point, you know, that he wants to take, go back to the IMO to talk this out. You know, not the US go on its own. They understand that, that to get a solution for global shipping, you need to go through the IMO. Thanks, uh, Edmund. And I think that's a very interesting point about the, um, the technology fund um, and two dollars per ton. Um, certainly, that that seems to be a decision that I believe will be taken fairly shortly to confirm that. Um, and, and that you know, because I, I guess for what I can say from where we sit in my day job, there's just an abundance of t proven technology that is not great at getting into the market as quickly as it should. So anything that can trigger that, I think, would be excellent. But also that, let's, let's say again, let's be frank here. You know, that we, we've got a history, a recent, very recent history of technology, you know, failing. Uh, the sector going full set, you know, steam ahead, excuse the pun, you know, uh, things like ballast water management treatments, uh, 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 you know, even scrubbers, you know, initially there were, there were some problems with them. And, and there is even now with the question mark over wash water discharge. You know, I, I think I think you know the people, and and, and again now we, there's question marks raised about LNG and the investment that's being put into LNG. So people are, you know, not un, unsurprisingly, once bitten twice shy, and I can understand that. So how are we going to demonstrate this technology works? And we've seen companies, certain companies, go out and really have to push their technology to get it into the mainstream, and they've done it, and they've done it successfully. But that again is on the backdrop of regulatory requirements, and then demonstrating that their their technology can help meet those regulatory requirements. Yeah, I, I actually think for most of those uh, clean tech startups, it's the ROI that's driven their business. But but I take your point. Um, on the same point, um, I've gone dark here. Um, around 20, you know, what we need to do for IMO 20, to, to meet IMO 2030 standards. And indeed, adding to that, what's the sort of path of least resistance? Um, Jonathan, have you, have you got some thoughts there? Yeah, we've um, we've done a little bit of analysis on the on the fleets and bulk carriers, uh, container vessels, and uh, and tankers. For example, sixty eight percent of the bulk carrier fleet will have to do something to comply with the EXI requirements that are coming up. Um, and of those, when we analyse them, we note that um, generally they're running at a speed that's around twenty percent lower than their design speed, which is going back to the comment that Mark made earlier. So if you just apply a 50% power reduction to the vessel, you get that 20% reduction in speed. And so on that basis, you're left with about 6% of the bulk carrier fleet that actually need to physically do some more serious modifications than just a power limitation. Um, and you can apply the same logic to tankers and container vessels. I think the simplest and easiest way is people will just go for these power limitation devices. However, I think if we do that, we're just missing an opportunity really because you have um, a bulbous bow that's been designed for a different speed. You have a propeller that's been designed for a different speed. I think if you go back to basics and then design the, uh, the propulsion system for this new speed, and go and check your bulbous bow, then I think you'll get more efficiency gains than just going for the power limitation. And it gives you an opportunity to look at the same time at other, other um, devices, propeller boss cap fins, rudder bulbs, that kind of thing as well. But I think that's just looking at the EEXI, you also need to look at operational measures with, without anything to do with the design of your vessel. Um, um, looking at uh, making sure you arrive just in time, looking at the actual routing of your vessel based on weather, making sure your coating's clean. I think those will, will make a, a big impact as well. Yeah. Thanks, Jonathan. And, and Lindsay, uh, if I can bring you in here as well on, on these points, and I know you've had some involvement with the Poseidon principles as well, and, and your today's conversation has been around 
you know, how regulation can 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 work in conjunction with outside drivers like Poseidon. And so I'm very curious to hear hear your thoughts as, as to where um, IMO needs to go, uh, but also from a ship owner uh, perspective, what the sort of best path might be. I, I, I wouldn't pretend to be able to say what the IMO should be doing. I'm definitely not a tech, technical person, but um, I, th I think looking at other industries and, and that collaboration piece, I think is really important for, for ship owners. I, we, um, the survey that I referred to that What Safari did in, in the autumn, it was quite clear that forming JVs and collaboration was a clear clear winner in terms of raising funding. But when we drilled down and we asked, okay, who would you collaborate with? The overwhelming response was other ship owners. And maybe there maybe there's more of a need to invest in looking working with the renewables players, working with oil and gas players, the fuel producers, working maybe being more open to engaging with other types of industries to, to get that feedback. And you know, we're seeing that a little bit now with the um, offshore wind space and the need for the offshore wind installation vessels that people are going to start communicating a bit more. But I'd say engaging with others um, and, and sharing ideas to share the risk of, of, of this technological change that needs to needs to happen. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, I think it's a good segue to you, Mark, if you've got some thoughts, some closing thoughts. Yeah, a couple. Um, one, I think liner trades will be the will be the trades that start to really develop momentum when it comes to fuel type and fuel use. For those of us who are in tramp trades, we have the difficulty attached with um, not knowing which way to move first. Secondly, we, you know, a year ago, if you asked me, would we have ever invested in methanol to hydrogen reforming units? And we did, and we did so because um, we have an energy transition plan. And I think more and more companies out there, if little old Armour can have an energy transition plan, imagine, you know, what the Mersks and the MSCs of this world are doing. So there's an enormous amount of, of, you know, kind of goodwill and good effort that's out there. That ties in with the R&D levy that we were talking about and where that is. But right now there is technology that's out there that can produce hydrogen safely on board. And I think safety isn't a thing that anybody's spoken about yet because there are some massive hurdles to be overcome with some of the technologies that we're talking about. Um, but we, got inv we invested in that because we believe in it as a technology. We believe there is space for it. Um, we're not either arguing that it's propulsive power, it's electrical generation power. And that's the genesis for us in this whole equation. Thanks, Mark. That's really fascinating. And and Sean, same questions to you, please. Yeah, I'll take take the risk of reigniting the lively debate that Edmund and I had earlier this morning. Um, yeah, I, I agree that if the IMO could take the lead and drag everyone along behind them, that would be ideal. And that's why it's quite right for John Kerry to push them. But the reality is there are lots of other drivers out there at the moment. And there are lots of other things that can be done to improve performance. Ardmore is a great example of it, that um, rather than waiting around for someone to tell them to do it, they're recognising the need and, and doing it now. So I think anyone who wants to wait and do nothing has probably got a terminal strategy. Anyone who wants to do it slowly and do the bare minimum has got a really dangerous one. So I think the, the answer is take the responsibility to move forward now. Thanks, Sean. Um, uh, so I've actually introduced a couple of points from the audience. So, so they've, they've, we've kind of, kind of filtered those through. Um, but I think if there are some certain themes coming through today, it's that um, in some, some regards and potentially you know, we're, we're, we're entering a period of transition where that, that push beyond compliance becomes the key driver, arguably even uh, more preeminent than, than regulation. And, and then ultimately, albeit with, with some detail uh, from, from Jonathan and, and certainly some nuances, if you're going beyond compliance, if you're pushing ahead um, and, and, and meeting the demands of financiers and cargo owners, then the likelihood is you will be compliant with the likes of EEXI and CII. Um, but it's certainly a, a new era where that pressure is changing and altering, and, and it's, as we said earlier, complex and fluid to some degree. Um, so I'd, I'd like to, to thank you all um, very much for your contribution. Um, I, I know we covered a lot in a short space of time, 
Um, and uh, just to say this, this video will be appearing on the Holder website, hopefully uh, in the next few days. So thanks very much for joining and thanks to our panelists.